All right, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so quick introduction, um, I am Nick Chase, as I said. I handle technical content here at Mirantis. Uh, I, it says I'm a former member of the Kubernetes release team, but actually this release, I was back on those release notes. So, um, but you don't care about me. Let's get into the content. Okay, uh, so real quick, just talking about what we are going to talk about. Uh, we're going to start with a discussion of structural schemas, which is kind of a new thing that affects a lot of the other new features that uh, that are in this release. So we'll cover those briefly. Um, then we'll talk about the features that are now generally available, and then we'll work our way back, you know, through the features that have been promoted to beta and then the new stuff and then we'll answer your questions so that is what we're going to cover so moving right along um i want to just kind of uh let you know that we have some training here for those of you who are just kind of getting started uh, or if you want to take the uh kubernetes uh, administrator uh class you can jump in and take those uh, certification rather you can jump in and take those classes and we also have a new istio class so i encourage you to check these out all right so moving right along into the actual information that you came for so structural schemas now uh as you know uh kubernetes is designed to be extensible you can create uh these uh custom uh, resources, the CRDs, and uh, generally uh, we have been using OpenAPI. And the thing is, OpenAPI is designed to let you describe pretty much anything, which is great unless you're trying to build an automated system to interpret those definitions. So the community has decided that they want to standardize on what they call structural schemas, which eliminate a lot of the ambiguity as to what these schemas actually say. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of what is structural, what's not structural, and so on. Um, so basically, these structural schemas are a subset of these open API schemas. If you produce your uh, definitions directly from your code using like CRD gen or open API gen, you already have structural schemas. You don't have to worry about that. If you're handwriting them or if you're augmenting what comes out of the uh, generated stuff, then you do need to worry about it. So, uh, if you are using vBeta 1, you don't need to worry about whether or not your schemas are structural. Okay, uh, they're still going to work. Uh, your, uh, you will receive a non-structural schema condition. It will not error out, but you will receive that condition. Um, but you also will not be able to use um, the new features. And we'll talk about what those new features are in, in a minute. However, if you're moving along to V1, structural schemas will go ahead and will be required. So you want to go ahead and start thinking about this. All right, so what, is this, what does this mean? What is a structural scheme? Uh, basically, the short definition is they say all types and the possible object fields within a JSON object must be apparent from a structural schema without understanding the logical junctures of any of, all of, one of, and not. Yeah, that certainly cleans it up. Uh, there's actually four main rules. You, uh, you need to make sure that you have an actual type for the object, and we'll see examples of all of these, and for each property of the object. And you need to make sure that, so you need to make sure that all of these things are uh, specified. And you need to make sure that they're specified, whoop, not in any of these all of any of and so on um there's there's so these are the basic four basic rules you know you you don't want to set the description the type the default and so on in any of these all ofs uh and the only fields that you can uh that you can restrict on metadata are the name and generate name all right again 
what does all that actually mean? So let's take a look at this uh, non-structural schema. Okay, here we have two properties. We have foo and we have bar. Okay, now why is this non-structural? Well, we've got a few problems with this thing. First off, uh, the actual object type is not defined at the root. So this, this is in the wrong place, okay? Um, the property bar is not defined outside of any of. The type for foo is not defined anywhere. Uh, the description is not defined outside of an any of. So all of these, so we're basically breaking all of the rules with this. So if we were to take this and try and turn it into a structural schema, it would look like this, where we're defining the, uh, the type at the root. We've got the description outside of the any of in the root. Um, we've got foo and bar both defined outside of any of, and their types are defined. You can still put properties into an any of you just need to make sure that things like the type and you know defaults and so on and so forth are defined outside of any of so that validation can be performed properly the whole idea behind this is to create a canonical representation and of course there are always exceptions to every rule so there are four uh markers annotations uh that you can add to allow you to do something that violates these rules. For example, um, Kubernetes into a string, you set that to true, and then you can uh, and then you can create something like this, where yeah, the type is not at the root or outside of any of all of and so on. Um, other thing, uh, there are some other annotations you can use, um, unions, embedded resource. Preserve unknown fields uh, is exactly what it says. So basically, if you have an object with a field that is not defined in the schema, do you want to keep it or, uh, or prune it? And we'll talk about pruning later. Um, so these, so what features are enabled by these schemas? Well, one, uh, by these structural schemas. One is the ability to do open API schemas, and yeah, I see I've got an extra space there, um, for CRDs. Now, these, are thing, these, are, these schemas are already supported for core objects, so it lets you do this server-side validation and automatic documentation creation and doing an explain on these objects. You can now do this um, with uh, CRDs and not just core objects. Also defaulting and pruning. Defaulting meaning if you put forth an object with missing values that have defaults defined, those default values are added. Pruning, we talked about that a little, you know, like 30 seconds ago. If there's a field that is not defined, it will be removed unless you specifically say that you want to preserve those uh, unknown fields. Another thing that is enabled by uh, these uh, by these structural schemas is webhook conversion. So if you are sending resources to a webhook, let's say you got it stored as version one, but you're requesting version two uh, or vice versa, the system can now do that conversion between versions if you have a structural schema. So, okay, so that is structural schemas and, and the things that they are uh, enabling. So moving right along to a couple of features that have been marked as generally available. Um, these are things that have, that are ready and ready for production or considered ready for production. And they are also uh, enabled by default. You don't need to do anything, just go ahead and, uh, and use them. So, um, all right, so uh, let's take a look at what we've got. So the first one of those, we have two of these. One is server-side descriptions. 
So what this means is if you do a kube control get, um, before that was handled on the client side, which is cumbersome, it's hard to maintain, and it's difficult for things like CRDs. So, um, and, and especially third-party API extensions. So the idea is this is now handled on the server side, so it is consistent and, um, and you get these um, custom, uh, and you get the ability to do it on all of these uh, objects. Coop control can describe is not yet on the server side, but the plan is to get it there in a future release. Uh, okay, now Go module support. This is something that you may or may not be affected by. Um, Go 113, uh, if you build Go applications at all, uh, you know that Go path is kind of like the class path in Java or, you know, just the path, I guess, in, in other language. Uh, but um, so, Go 113 is going to deprecate that in favor of these modules. And um, the way that this works, it makes it much easier to create these consistent experiences on any operating system. So less of a less of a hassle between Linux and Windows and Mac and so on and so forth. But as a user, uh, it enables you to use two different Go modules simultaneously. So if you've got if you've got custom programming in your Kubernetes cluster and, and this uses this module and this uses that module, um, you can now uh, handle that. So the idea is to move away from GoDap and the way that it's been used before to using Go modules. Okay. Moving right along. Um, this is in the wrong order, but here it is anyway. Kubeadam, uh, Kube, Kubeadmin improvements. So um, lifecycle management, if you create your clusters using uh, Kubeadmin, uh, there are some improvements in beta that you can use, particularly with regards to uh, high availability. Now there are two different ways to do dynamic HA with kubeadmin. Uh, one is to use a stacked control plane where you basically have more than one control plane, obviously. Uh, and the other is to uh, in introduce uh, redundancy in your etcd cluster. Either way, um, what you'll have is three masters and not just one, at least three workers. Uh, and if you're using the etcd cluster method, uh, the uh, three etcd nodes, and then a load balancer that obviously distributes the traffic among all of those control planes. Um, also in kubeadmin, they are, uh, so kubeadmin was created to create, to make a simple way to uh, manage your cluster life cycles. Uh, you've got your inits and your joins and so on uh, to create these clusters, but when you use kubeadmin, there are various flags that you can put on the command line. And some of them, uh, and as things get more complicated, the, uh, the, the preferred way to do this has been to put it into a config file so that uh, you know it's more maintainable, it's and and so on. Um, but what we now wind up with is there are fields that don't actually have an API endpoint, so you have to use the config file in order to achieve these various configurations. Um, and also, uh, you know, there are various <laughs> there are various repeatability issues. You know, if you set of settings, that needs to be persisted. So, um, so V1 beta 2 introduces some specialized substructures that help with all of this uh, and also allow new features such as, you know, copying certificates and specifying pre-flight errors to ignore 
uh, and and so on. So go ahead and take a look at V1 beta 2 uh, and see what you've got going on there. All right, other beta features. So these are features that are on by default, but not necessarily production ready. So uh, you want to look at them carefully and you can still turn them off at the feature gate. Um, so uh, one to look at is admission webhooks. So admission webhooks ha have, have been around. These admission controllers are what decide whether a particular request can go through or not, okay? And um, you use these all the time, whether or not you're using them through webhooks, because a lot of what Kubernetes does is done through these admission controllers. Um, and uh, but webhooks let you specify your own logic for them, so you can decide whether or not things happen. And there are two kinds of webhooks. Mutating admission webhooks take the request and they make changes to it, obviously mutating. Validating does exactly what it says on the tin, makes sure that they're okay. And what it is, is these webhooks have always been executed in alphabetical order, which is great unless something that starts with A needs to react to something that starts with Q. Um, so now mutating webhooks, you can now invoke them more than once. If you set the re-invocation policy uh, to if needed, they get another shot uh, after everything has uh, after everything has been mutated, I guess you could say. All right. Uh, node local DNS cache. So um, we we're dealing with a sort of single point of failure. Um, now it's set up in such a way that if node local DNS doesn't uh, doesn't provide the appropriate response or any response, I guess you could say, it will also listen on the kube DNS service IP. So um, there, there's an external component that makes the determination of which one it's going to listen to. And this only works with IP tables. It does not work with IPVS yet. Uh, you get an idea of what the architecture looks like here. Um, and you can see how this is set up. So uh, if you look here under the service, uh, under the service spec, uh, you will see that we've got two ports, DNS and DNS TCP. They're both on port 53. If you look under here, local DNS, We've got our local IP, and then we've got the additional IP that was added by all of this. All right. Uh, online resizing of persistent volumes. So uh, it's great that you can resize a volume. Lord knows I wish I could do that with a lot of things in my life. Um, but uh, it has always been a pain because you had to terminate the pod and unmount the volume and then resize it and then start it back up again and so on and so forth. So now uh, you don't have to do that. Uh, you make sure that your PVC is in read-write mode and also make sure that you have uh, enabled this particular feature gate. Uh, it is enabled by default, as I said. All right. Uh, environment variables expansion. So sometimes you have a situation where you want to say create a directory or do something that is related to say the pod name or uh, something like that because say you're saving log files or doing something else that requires you to have separate stuff per pod. Um, so one thing that you can do now in beta is you can now define environment variables and use them as a subpath when you're mounting uh, when you're mounting these volumes. So you got your mount path, and then you can create a subpath that uses these uh, environment variables. So very handy for log files and, and other pod specific things. Um, pod disruption budget. So uh, again, on the subject of custom resources, uh, you already know that only so many um, pods can be out of service for deployment or a stateful set and so on and so forth. You can now do this for custom resources. And the way that this works 
uh, is there's a new scale sub resources, uh, 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 a new scale sub resource that provides the number of uh, replicas that you want. Uh, so you can do this for any resource. So the reason that this wasn't available before is there was no real good way for Kubernetes to know how many you wanted. Um, PID limiting. So uh, PID limiting is intended to prevent things like, you know, you could have a fork bomb where one process forks all kinds of processes and just takes all the processes on the node and then nothing else can run. Um, this is, you can do this at the node level. Uh, you see here an example. So like just as you can set CPU and memory, you can also set the number of PIDs that are reserved for uh, the system and reserved for Kubernetes itself. Um, you can also isolate this at the pod level uh, via the support pods limit feature gate um, using the pod max PIDs uh, flag. Okay. Uh, third party device monitoring plugins. So, uh, if you've got third party devices hooked up, uh, it would be nice if you would be able to actually see what was going on. You would think that that would be something that you could have done before now, but now here it is. So, uh, these are container level metrics uh, that are done through the device plugins. Okay, this is done through the pod resources service. Uh, and finally, in beta, uh, AWS has a, a new load balancer. It's got some uh, it's got some features that were not available before, um, such as being able to use multiple ports, web sockets, and and so on and so forth. Um, and in order to use that, you just need to set the uh, load balancer type plugin, uh, that plugin uh, annotation rather. Okay, so um, now let's talk about new features. Generally, these are off by default. Okay, these are things that are sort of experimental, and um, you can play with them if you want to. You can turn them on via feature gates, but keep in mind that by design they may change. So um, these are these are like I said, they're experimental. So don't write you know life or death software that depends on how it's implemented right at this minute because that could change as i said all right so um one thing everyone's excited about is the ability to clone a volume so let's say you have an existing pvc uh you can then reference that as your data source so you can see in the example here we're defining a pvc and we're setting the data source as another PVC and we're naming that one. Um, some things to keep in mind, um, this is different from a snapshot. So you've got a snapshot. A snapshot is, is a copy of what it's like at a particular point in time, but you can't use a snapshot by itself. A snapshot can only be used to either recreate a pod or to or a volume rather, or recreate uh, or, or to create a new one, et cetera. But this is a volume that is good to go on its own, uh, send it off to college and give it some spending money. All right, and some other things to keep in mind, this only works with CSI drivers, it only works with dynamic provisioners, and it only works for drivers that have implemented cloning. So obviously, if clone volume is not implemented, nothing's going to happen. Uh, also, you need to make sure that uh, both the clone and the original are in the same namespace. Okay, um, another, another thing that they are, that they have built during this cycle is a scheduling framework. Now, the idea here is to enable people, to, people and companies to uh, to create plugins for 
the scheduler. So these plugins are then compiled into the scheduler um, and you can hit various extension points and so on. So they created this API and obviously, you know, that's, that's still kind of in the works. So if you're interested in scheduling, go ahead and jump in and, and uh, see what you can do with that. All right, um, priority classes. So non-preempting priority classes. Um, so as you know, uh, when you have a higher priority pod, um, if it needs to be, uh, if it needs to be instantiated and there's no room, it can preempt existing pods that uh, that have a lower priority. So the idea here is that if you set preempt lower priority to never, uh, it will prevent new pods from being spawned on that, from being spawned, um, but it won't actually kill any that are there. So as things die, it will, uh, it will create new pods and it will take those resources, but it won't actually kill anything. And um, you know, it uses your, your regular back off policy, oops, uses your regular back off policy for retries until it's got the desired number of um, pods. Okay, so um, you also now have the ability to execute uh, user code in your pods through the execution hook, this is a web hook, and the execution hook controller. So um, these webhooks are not tied to the start or termination of the pod. So you can call them whenever you want and um, they are, uh, so you can set up your system to, you know, execute code at any particular uh, arbitrary time. File system quotas for ephemeral storage. So right now, these quotas are enforced by uh, walking the file system tree. Uh, this is faster, it's more accurate. It only works for empty dir uh, ephemeral storage. And right now also, it's, there's no enforcement. It's just monitoring it. If you're using F XFS volumes, this is already in place. However, if you are using X4FS volumes, you need to create them specifically uh, in a specific way, which the command is right here, and run also the tune to FS command. You also need to make sure that you mount it in Etsy FS tab with the project option. Uh, and uh, make sure that if you need it, you set root flags equals P quota. All right. Uh, load balancer finance, blah, blah, blah. load balancer finalizer protection. I've rented teeth today. Okay, so uh, right now sometimes we have a problem with orphaned load balancers. So uh, if you have a load balancer on a service and you go ahead and delete the service, and then the load balancer is just kind of hanging out there and there's no way to delete it. So uh, what this does is it makes sure that the load balancers are gone before the service is actually deleted. Uh, event API improvements, uh, again, more structure, better deduplication. This is intended to kind of prevent events from overwhelming uh, the server when you are keeping an eye on them. All right, so that brings us to the end. Um, let me let me go to uh, if you have not if you have not asked your questions yet, now is the time. Go ahead and drop them into the uh, the questions pane, and we will get them onto uh, onto the list and we will go ahead and get them answered. So let me see, I know we have a few questions already. Let me grab them. Here we go. Okay, um, can, can flex volumes be resized online? Okay, so 
Um, the answer is uh, any volume can be resized online as long as the driver supports it. So if your flex volume uh, driver supports it, then yeah, no, no problem. Um, let's see, what happens if a CRD doesn't have a schema? How is information displayed? Okay, uh, so basically if there's no schema, uh, they, they're just gonna do, the system is basically just gonna do the best that it can. <laughs> it's gonna make it as complete as possible. Um, but you know it's going to go by the open a the uh, open api spec so you really if you want this information to be available to your users uh just go ahead and create the schemas so it's it's not it's not hard um and again like i said there's there's code that will uh there there are programs that will go ahead and uh create those for you um let's see so um where are we <laughs> looking for other questions just a second okay okay uh how can i just let kubernetes allocate all available pods rather than limiting per pod. I, I think it means all available PIDs rather than limiting per pod. Um, if you set pod max PIDs to, to negative one, uh, then it'll just be as if you didn't limit it at all. Um, okay. We've got two more. I, Let's see if anybody else wants to jump in. Uh, what happens to the original if you delete a clone? Uh, I assume you mean a cloned volume. Uh, and the answer is absolutely nothing. They're totally unconnected. Once you clone a volume, that cloned volume is completely independent of the original. Um, okay. Can they use structural schemas in production? Uh, well, I mean, I, I don't think it's gonna hurt anything if you use them um, because they are basically a subset of regular schemas, uh, but I wouldn't rely on the new features that they enable in production. Okay, so, um, do we have any other questions? be as if you didn't limit it at all. Um, okay. We've got two more. I, you know, let's see if anybody else wants to jump in. Uh, what happens to the original if you delete a clone? Uh, I assume you mean a cloned volume. Uh, and the answer is absolutely nothing. They're totally unconnected. Once you clone a volume, that cloned volume is completely independent of the original. Um, okay, can I use structural schemas in production? Uh, well, I mean, I, I don't think it's gonna hurt anything if you use them um, because they are basically a subset of regular schemas, uh, but I wouldn't rely on the new features that they enable in production. Okay, so um, do we have any other questions? Because I can't, I can't imagine that we've gone this far and nobody's got anything, any other questions. Because we're really early. We got like nineteen minutes. Okay, so I'll tell you what. Let me. Do this. Hold on. Okay. So, uh, all right. Well, I guess I'm going to say thank you all very much. Uh, and I want to thank my super, super producer, Michelle Yukura. She, I can't do this without her. 
Um, you will have the slides and the recordings by Monday. You can download the slides today. Um, and I'm really interested to hear what you would like to hear more about. Um, so thank you all very much.